I've met the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. I've never seen her before. Here, you will choose someone to marry. Hello. Nice to hear from you. Hey. Can't say see ya. Without ever seeing her. If you're ready to find the love of your life, game time. The pods are now open. What kind of work do you do? So what are some of your biggest turnoffs? So what are you looking for in a woman? Ethnicity, race, physical appearance. None of that matters. I'm really starting. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Jolly Heretic. Now, one of my secret little pleasures, although it's perhaps not so secret anymore, is that Mrs Jolly Heretic and I enjoy nothing more than opening up a bottle of white wine or two and watching Love is Blind. Uh, Love is Blind is a Netflix series. It's now in its ninth season, in which uh, a group of people, male and female, are placed essentially in separate houses where they where they live together and they go on dates with people of the opposite sex in pods which are separated by substantial walls so that they can't see each other or I suppose indeed smell each other and over the course of the series some of them will gradually or at least supposedly get to know each other get to like each other and fall in love and then one of them almost always the man has to propose to the woman and she has to accept, even though they've never seen each other and don't know what the other looks like. And then there's a reveal and then they go away on a holiday together and then it culminates after a number of weeks in them deciding to get married or not get married. And in many cases, we meet each other's family, that sort of thing. Um, and in many cases, they, uh, say, they, they say no at the altar. And it's made clear that this is more acceptable in this than it would otherwise be. So that's it. That's Love is Blind. And it's in the news at the moment because <clears throat> a woman said no at the altar for woke reasons. A woman called Sarah said no at the altar because her su supposed husband basically wasn't woke enough. And I want to look in this uh, episode at how Love is Blind works in terms of the research, in terms of the evolutionary kind of research, uh, and also just uh, the, the details, the, uh, the, the, the psychology of how this works and why she did this. Before I do that, could you please do me a favour? Could you subscribe? Could you subscribe here on The Jolly Heretic and hit the like button and leave a like and share it and all that stuff to help help the algorithm? And could you subscribe to my substack? That's jollyheretic.com, where, uh, where there's in-person interviews, vlogs, all the most based stuff I don't put on YouTube, uh, movies I make, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and where if you like what I do, you could support me for the cost of a pint of beer a month. OK, back to the video. So, in theory, love is blind. The idea is, it's, it's testing that Shakespeare uh, phrase, love is blind. Now, that, of course, relates to the idea that love makes you mad. Love makes you blind in the sense that it makes you mad and you don't see the negative qualities of the person with whom you are in love. You only see the positive qualities. They're obviously taking that literally and that the idea that love is literally blind, that you, that you can't see the other person and can you fall in love genuinely uh, when you can't see the other person. And the idea is, oh, well, it overcomes. Look, it, it's, so, it's so lovely, isn't it? It, it overcomes this idea that we judge people by what they look like. By, we judge their physical attractiveness, all this. It, it's just on their personalities. It's just on whether we bond with them. And isn't that beautiful? And it's nonsense. It's nonsense. Of course you can fall in love with a person based on their voice alone, uh, what do you think? Well, blind people, to be fair, it's also going to involve smell, which they're, con they're eliminating from this, and touch. But of course you can fall in love with a person based on their voice alone without seeing them. Uh, why is this the case? Well, first of all, uh, there is a d we know that we, we select, in part, for genetic similarity. Genetic similarity allows us to pass on more of our genes. So if we're going to invest in our offspring and thus reduce the number of children we have and reduce the number of partners we have in order to invest in them, then we have to compensate for this in genetic terms. How do we do this? We select for people who are genetically similar to ourselves and so we pass on more of our genes. Therefore, we are selected, to, we are attracted to such people. Now, there's a study called Sequence Variance Affecting voice pitch in humans. 
And what this shows is that what your voice sounds like is highly genetic. So this means that you will be able to discern from a person's voice alone the degree to which they are genetically similar to you. And if you are the kind of person, a K strategist, as it were, one who, who prioritises nurture over just pure sex, uh, who is attracted to such things, then obviously you will be attracted to a person who has a voice um, in the general range of things that is similar to yours, because that voice is conveying to you the fact of their genetic similarity. So that's the first reason why we shouldn't be surprised that you can fall in love with somebody without actually seeing them in this system that they have on Love is Blind. Um, the second reason is that you can we are evolved to be sexually attracted to attractive people, people who are conveying to us that they have good genes, because those people are more likely to survive in prehistory, and those people are more likely to have healthy offspring in prehistory that survive, because attractiveness, for example, an attractive face, a symmetrical and, and good-looking face, is telling you that you have sufficiently good genes to be able to fight off um, pathogens and things like that, and to, to reach a, a, a symmetrical phenotype. So, we would expect people to be attracted, obviously, to objectively attractive people. Can this be done using voice only? The answer is yes. Uh, there is a study, ratings of voice attractiveness predict sexual behaviour uh, and, and, um, and body composition. And so what this is telling you is that people that have attractive voices also have attractive bodies and behave, uh, and behave in certain ways uh, sexually. So all kinds of things are, are attractive in the voice. For example, a pitch. Pitch is attractive. A high-pitched voice in a woman, a low-pitched vo uh, voice in a man. Resonance. This can be discerned from the voice. Is the voice clear? Is the voice confident? There is a degree to which, therefore, the voice um, is allows you to discern things like testosterone. Is, is he a high-testosterone man with a deep voice, or is she a high-eastern woman with quite a high voice? And so attractiveness is inherent or, or low attractors or high attractors in the nature of the voice. So again, we can see why people would fall in love with people sight unseen. Another study is called Differential Vocal Parameters Predict Perceptions um, of, attract of, um, and, and, of, attra of Attractiveness. And so this is interesting. This means that people genuinely can correctly discern how attractive, within a margin of error, and I don't know how strong the correlation is, but there is a degree to which, if you play people voices, they will rate them for attractiveness. And this will correlate with how objectively attractive, you know, their faces are or their bodies are. The, the, the things are related. So you can discern attractiveness from the voice. So in so much as the two key factors involved in being attracted to somebody are that they are genetically similar to you and that they are within the range that you can achieve it, um, objectively attractive and thus signifiers of good genes, this can be achieved from the voice. Now then you have the other aspects which is just bonding, uh, having ha happening to have things in common. Uh, that, that you can you can bond over and feel bonded with someone over, and obviously this process of blind dates uh, allows you to to achieve that. So, of course, love can be blind, but there is a degree. But remember, we're talking about weak correlations here, and so it does, of course, happen, and it's happened a, a few times on the show that they seem to fall in love in the pod. And then the person meets the other person and just finds them viscerally sexually unattractive. Uh, that can happen, and, and it has happened. And they haven't even gone away to Hawaii or Greece or wherever they go on holiday to, to get to know each other better uh, in person because, because of that. And, and there have been cases where a person has had to choose between one person and the other, and they're not quite sure, but, uh, but they want to marry somebody because they're there on telly, I guess. And so they choose the wrong person. 
And then when they actually meet them in real life, the person who they rejected, because they, they then do a thing where the people that are rejected come back and there's parties and things like this, then they really, really like the person they rejected and it all, it all, kinds of goes, all kind of goes wrong. But in general, we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that love is blind. Now, an example of this, uh, of, and perhaps of the kind of people who are involved in the show, can be found in Sarah and Ben. Of course, the people that are going to go on a TV show like that and expose their souls on a TV show like that are not going to be representative of the population of Minnesota, which is the, where, where Series 9 is, most of them are from. Um, they are going to be the kind of people that like attention. They are going to be high in narcissistic traits. They, are, they, you know, they want to be admired. They, they are probably quite fast life history strategic uh, because that is, i.e., the kind of people that are will, will uh, prioritize sex over nurture. Otherwise, why would they want to go on TV like that and be in a show like that? Why wouldn't they just meet people down the pub like normal people do? Um, and so the particularly interesting couple that you have on this episode is Sarah and Ben. Uh, Sarah, as I recall, is a nurse. I can't remember what Ben did. Something quite boring. And it, as, as they get outside the pods, we start to realise that there are interesting differences between them. Ben goes, goes to church. Sarah is basically an atheist. And that's the reversal of how it normally is. Normally, it's the woman that's more religious than the man, if that's going to be the case. But no, in, in, in this instance, no. And she wants, she's concerned about this going to church because she's, she's a bit woke. She's a bit woke and she has a sister, a sister who, by the way, I mean, neither her nor her sister are very good looking, but her sister is better look looking than her. But her sister seems to be a kind of femme lesbian. Sarah has a very manly chin, very manly chin, uh, is quite masculinized female, which is interesting. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, she rejects him at the altar. And her justification for rejecting him at the altar is she wants, she's not sure yet that they're on the same wavelength. I mean, this is also a very dramatic thing to do. She could have called everything off beforehand. She could have discerned this information in the pods and then not married him. Having then spent, I, I forget how, is it eight weeks with him? She could have discerned this information and then not gone to the altar. But no, she wants to go to the altar. She wants to make it all dramatic. She wants to be the centre of attention. She wants to be histrionic, essentially, which is what predicts being woke. If you look at the studies on this, if you look in my book, uh, Woke Eugenics, where I look at all the studies, wokeness is associated with narcissism. Why? Because if you're narcissistic, you're insecure, you create, you create, you have all these bad feelings about yourself. So you create this false self that you're perfect to protect yourself from those false feelings. How do you reassure yourself you're perfect? You uber socially conform and then people tell you that you're great and you're morally good and you're better than other people. And so then you feel good. You get narcissistic supply. That's why woke people are attracted. Um, to, that's why, sorry, narcissistic type people in the, at the moment are in a left-wing environment, are generally attracted to being left-wing. And such people are also uh, highly judgmental. There's a, there's a, a study called uh, At Least Bias Speaks. Are you ready for the future of the West? 